got them on, but not doing it's not going very fast. Yeah.
in, interpret them to do things like perform operations on registers and update memory and things like that. That's called the data path part of the, uh, the circuit. And we'll go on from there. Things are going to start sliding around when we get over here. I'll spend more time on some sections and less on others. But that's the scope of what I'm going to try to get through. Um, let's see. I'm trying to videotape with a different camera. My little camera does great pictures, but it has a 2 gig file size limit, which is about 20 minutes. So I found this thing. It's made to do two hours of high definition. And it actually works. It comes out decent quality. The battery only lasts an hour. Fail. Um, and when you plug it in to charge the battery or run it off the wall, it won't record. It like, shuts down all the functions. None of which matters because it overheats after 50 minutes of recording and shuts down. <laughs> so, so I took an old cell phone cord and, and made some fake batteries that look like AAA sitting in the front, and that seems to work. And hopefully it'll run for an hour and a quarter. Um, the videos from that are big, but if you want to get a copy of one of the lectures, if you missed a class or you want to go back and refer it, Bring a USB drive or something next class, and I'll give you a copy. Um, I may post them on YouTube. Depends how good the quality is when I compress them. But if I do that, I'll give you a URL where you can find them. So that'll be available. Um, any questions? All right. So up to this point, we've been talking about combinational circuits, and combinational circuits they have a few different characteristics that are similar. Um, the main characteristic is there's no loops in a combinational circuit. If you look at the output, so you can think of your circuit as sitting inside a box, and you have inputs, and you have outputs, and you have all sorts of circuitry inside. If what's in here is a combinational circuit, you can take any of these outputs, it'll be the output of some gate, and that gate will have inputs. And either those inputs come from the outside, or they come from the output of other gates. Okay, if they come from the output of other gates, you can look at those gates' inputs, and they'll either come from the outside, or they'll come from the output of other gates. When we say there's no loops, it means that you never find an input that's being driven by an output that that input is connected to through this chain. Okay, it's loop-free, and if you work through the logic of that, what that means is that basically each of these outputs is a function only of the inputs. Okay, and that's all it depends on. And that means it has no state, it has no memory. Because if this circuit could somehow remember something about previous states of the inputs, then the output would be a function of more than just these present inputs. It would also be a function of that state. Okay, so these are equivalent conditions. There's no state or memory. The output depends only on the current state of the inputs, and there's no loops. Okay, if you allow a loop, you get a very different situation. We, what we call a sequential circuit. And when you have a sequential circuit, when, when I say it has state, what it means is that just looking at the inputs doesn't tell you the whole story. There's information inside the circuit itself that can change over time and affect how the inputs turn into outputs. Okay, and a typical example of this would be a memory unit. You take a memory and you load up values in it, and you put in certain inputs to say, give me a value at some location, and you get an output. Well, the output depends on what you loaded in there previously. Okay, sequential circuits are very different from combinational circuits. And they're, they're absolutely critical in building CPUs and data paths, obviously, um, because they can keep track of what's been done in the past. Now, remember when we first talked about um, computer architectures in the past, I showed you that weird device that was called a mercury delay line memory. It was a big tube filled with mercury. And if you wanted to store bits, you could basically apply a pressure wave on one end. That wave would travel down the tube to the other end. You would sense it, take the output, amplify it a little bit, use it to regenerate the pressure wave, and you could trap a pattern inside this liquid mercury. And it's a way to store information. Okay, And it, it's basically a feedback path. And it's very much like feedback, you know, when you have a microphone and a speaker, and you get too close to the speaker and start squealing. Okay, it's the same thing happening. If you have a microphone, it goes into an amplifier, comes out a speaker, you have three possible things that can happen. One, you may be far enough away from the speaker that when you say something and it comes out and that amplified sound reaches the speaker, 
it's softer than your original input. Okay, and each time it goes through, it'll get softer and softer, and it'll die out. You basically don't hear anything except your original voice. Okay, that's the normal case. If you stand right next to the speaker and you whisper into the microphone, that whisper comes out of the speaker a little louder, goes into the microphone, comes out a little louder still, and very quickly it overloads the amplifier and you just get that screeching sound that you hear as feedback. Okay, there's a third case in between though. If you start off far away and you slowly walk towards the speaker while you're speaking at a constant volume, at some point you'll start to hear an echo. And what's happening is you're at the point where what's coming out of the speaker is almost the same volume as what you were originally speaking into the microphone. And you actually hear this echo of what you say. Now, it doesn't last very long. It quickly either fades out or it goes into full-blown feedback. But that feedback loop can actually trap the information that you were speaking. So, like, later on cell phone, you hear that echo? Yeah. Well, um, no, that's a different echo. That's, well, it's similar. On a cell phone, a lot of times what you're hearing is, like if someone's on a speaker phone, it comes out of the speaker and it goes back into their side and it comes back to you, but it doesn't keep circulating. But it's a similar idea. So if you get to this point where you can say something and you actually hear an echo of it, it kind of has this hollow sound to it, you're actually storing that. Okay, and that's the idea we're going to use for storing voltages, for storing voltage levels so we can store bits. Okay, we're going to make a feedback path. Now, how do you trap a voltage level? And your first idea might just be to take a wire and connect one end of it to itself and somehow set a voltage level in there, okay? I tried this when I was a kid. It didn't work. But it's not a bad idea. <laughs> it's, it's the right direction that you want to go in. The problem is wires don't have a way to store a charge. Okay? You need something like a capacitor to store a charge. You need some delay, and you need amplification. So this doesn't actually do anything, but it's pretty close to what we can use that will actually work, which is to add some gate delay. So if you take an OR gate, and you take its output and you feed it back in to both inputs on the OR gate, that will trap a bit. And the output will be either a zero or a one. And it's kind of undecidable which one it's going to be. But it will store a bit, and it will preserve it in there, okay? So that's, that's a simple storage unit, but we can't control which bit we're storing whether it's a zero or a one. Now we can do a little better if we take one of these inputs and we make it settable from outside. And if we suppose that this has initially got a zero trapped in this path, at some point we can set that input to one. And now you'll get a one coming out of the OR gate, which goes back in and keeps circulating. And now even if I set the input back down to zero, the output stays set. And so this is a simple form of an event detector. So in the timing diagram, you get something like this. And we're assuming that your output is zero originally. When you raise the input to one, the output goes high. And even when you drop the input, the output stays high. Okay, so you could use that like in a simple security system if you want to know if someone opened the door. As soon as they open the door, the circuit gets set. And even if they close the door quickly, it's still set. You know that, that this event happened. Okay, so that's a basic type of memory. It's good, but it's not incredibly useful because it's only good if you want to store a one. If we use a NOR, we have a way to get back to zeros. Because now if we put both zero in there, and we have this one, if we have a one coming through and we have a zero on the input, the output of the NOR will be a zero. Okay, but this is going to oscillate. This circuit here is basically, it's an inverter feeding itself. And if you look at that on an oscilloscope, it'll just bounce back and forth between zero and one. Okay, so we have a way to change the stored bit between zero and one knob is uncontrollable. So if we put those two together, we come up with, with an actual useful circuit. And this is a simple storage element. We can store a single bit in here.
So this is called a set reset latch. And if you look at the timing diagram for this, reset, reset, out. So everything starts at zero, and we'll assume the output is zero. When you raise the set input, that's going into a NOR gate. So one or anything is one, so the NOR comes down to a zero. This is a zero, reset is zero, the OR is zero, so the output is one, so you get a one on the output. And if you drop the set input to zero, you have this one coming in, a one NORD with anything is zero, you have a zero and a zero NORD together give you a one, everything is stable, your output stays at a one, even though we drop the set line back to zero. And now at some point, if we raise the reset line, while keeping set at zero, reset is a one, that'll change the NOR output to be a zero, so our output will drop. And that zero gets NOR with a zero, this becomes a one, one and one, now plus two, a zero, and everything is stable again. And now if we drop the reset, and you work through it, find that the output stays low. So this is a nice memory element, and it has this, this truth table. If you want to clear the bit that's stored in there, all you do is bump up the reset line momentarily. And you can bring it back down to zero, and the output stays low. And if you want to set the bit that's stored in there, you can raise the set line, drop it back down to zero, and the output will stay at one. OK, is that clear to everybody? Because everything we do is going to build on this one circuit. Everything else is just a variation of this basic idea. Okay, it's a set reset latch or an SR latch. Okay, we can add an enable input. And the idea of an enable input is. Most of these things, the output is always labeled Q. I don't know why. But Q is the output, and Q bar is the inverted output. Okay, you notice over here, if we had taken an output right here, that would always be the inverse allowed. So in these circuits, you usually have the stored bit and the complement of the stored bit available. So if you look at one of these chips, it will have a Q and a Q bar. So we can add an enable input, and the idea is if enable is zero, your output doesn't change. It ignores S and R. And it's doing that just by anding the enable with the S and R inputs. So even if you were to set S to one, what's going into this set of NOR gates is a zero on both lines. Okay, so enable is a way to disable S and R. And then if enable is one, you have the usual, if set is one, the output goes to 1. If reset is 1, the output goes to 0. And we assume that you're not going to set S and R to both 1. That's an illegal combo. Okay, so we have a flip flop that you can turn on and off. And you can turn the inputs on and off. Okay, we can also use this to make another type of latch called a, a D latch or a data latch. I use the words flip-flop and latch interchangeably. Technically, what we're talking about are latches. If I say flip-flop, I think latch. Um, I'll explain the difference in a minute. But these are basically latches because they simply, you open up the latch and the value goes in. You close the latch and the value is stored. So a deep flip-flop, you don't need to worry about a set input and a reset input. You just have a single input, which is D. So you have an enable line, you have a data line, and you have a Q. 
And if enable is zero, Q just stays at Q. Nothing changes. If enable is one, and D is one, then the output becomes one. And if enable is one and D is zero, the output goes to zero. Okay, a very simple truth table, but this is a nice device. This is a one-bit storage unit. And basically, if you want to store a bit, you just put it on D, bump up the enable line, close enable, and that bit will be stored. And it's, it's just an SR flip-flop. We're taking the inverse of D and we're feeding that into the reset line. We're taking the, um, the value of D and we're feeding that into the set line. So if D is 1, we're asserting set. And if D is 0, we're asserting reset. Okay, so it's the same circuit. And you usually see these things drawn with the NOR gates on top of each other with this cross coupling. That's a dead giveaway that you've got a latch or a flip flop. Okay, so that's a data latch. <coughs> Is this making sense? Kind of. Kind of? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out the set and uh, reset. This one? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out how the entire thing works. Okay, well let's let's um let's actually run through that. So everything is zero, let's assume that your output Q is, is initially zero. Okay, so you have a zero here and a zero here. And okay, that's the truth table of a NOR. So you have two zeros going in, your output is a one. You have a 1 and a 0 going in, your output is a 0. Okay, and it just keeps recirculating through and through. You get a 0 going in, you get a 1, and you get a 0. Okay, with both of these 0, this looks like two inverters. Okay, it's the same thing as. circuit looks when set and reset are zero. Okay, if you raise the set line to one, well, on one nord with anything is a zero, so this drops. Reset is zero, so zero nord with zero is one, and there's your output. Okay, so what you're doing is you're temporarily forcing this to output a zero, which forces this to be a one. And now if you force the reset line to a one, so one nord with anything is zero, so this is a zero out here. This will be a zero, set is still a zero, and zero nord with zero is one. Okay, so you're temporarily forcing this output to be zero, which puts a one into here. Traps that zero bit. Okay, it is a little weird. Um, and you, you can play with this in, in uh, Logic Sim also. Um, I was actually going to test some of these. And you can hook these things up and cross couple them and, and sort of see how the, the values chase each other around. So it uh, stores uh, voltage, yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. So I don't have how it 
doesn't solve pre like pressure or you kind of think about this like the electrons or how is it well, the storage? Comes. How is it actually storing it? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I can answer that. So these gates are power devices, you hook them up to a power supply and there's voltage coming into the transistors. So if you draw these things out as relays or transistors, you have power coming into the top of these transistors. Um, and that's what's actually supplying the electrons to get trapped, I guess, is the way you think about it. But because when you have zero inputs and you have one there, so, so how it appears one there, one voltage there, if you don't have input, it's like this. Well, I mean, if, if you just have an inverter and you put a zero input, you have five volts coming on the output. Because your inverter is powered. Your inverter is powered. Uh -huh, okay. It's connected to a power okay, rail. So. Inside an inverter or a gate, you have parts that are connected to ground and parts that are connected to five volts. Uh -huh, okay. And the inputs are choosing which of those two sources are being sent to the output, basically. Okay, so the... In the next couple slides, you have the Q prime or the Q not. Um, why is there not one here? Or um, there is. I just didn't label it. Oh, okay. Um, is that just yeah, right there? Yeah, Q bar is right here. It, okay, so one zero. So is Q bar just just the inverse of Q? It's just the inverse of Q. Or are you? Is there? Because when we when. Uh, we went over flip flops earlier. There was a, like a previous state or a next state Q. Is there? Uh, I just don't remember exactly how. Was that in here? Or no, 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 somewhere else. Yeah, okay. um, well, sometimes the way that you would write this would be. Um, like if the enable is zero, then the value of Q is the same as the previous value of Q. Um, sometimes that notation is used. But Q bar is just the opposite of Q. So the the way to to label a, a previous state Q is just by writing such a Q right? previous or sometimes there's a little prime mark that's used. Prime mark, that was that yeah. was the, um, which I don't like to use because that does mean inverse sometimes, um, but I have seen that used here, but I wouldn't do that unless you had a note saying that like that means the previous value of, okay. Well, it's possible you were looking at a truth table for something that actually does invert Q. Okay, we're going to talk about toggle flip-flops in a minute, and that might be what you were seeing. Um, so yeah, I mean, stay away from prime unless you, uh, you say what it is. But yeah, I think you'll recognize the toggle for flops. I set up, it always wants to do a gate with five inputs. No idea why. How would you change the inputs actually? Um, once you've selected a gate, you can come over here and oh, say okay. number of inputs. Yeah, because I had okay. five inputs when I okay. uh, first put it in. <laughs> yeah, you can change you can change um esoteric things like which way it's facing and the size. Um, you can change the number of bits. Um, we haven't talked about floating output values, but you can set it up so that instead of putting out a zero or a one, it puts out a zero or nothing. It just disconnects the output. And that's useful for, um, for hooking a lot of circuits together. So yeah, you can set the number of inputs there.
Okay, so that should look like what we've been playing with. I think those are actually connected. Okay, so now we have a simple flip flop. Um, this first switch, if we click it, we get a one on the output. Okay, and we get a zero on the complement of the output. And the bright green lines are one, the dark green lines are zero, so you can sort of trace through the operation and see what it's doing. If we set that back to zero, the output stays high. And then if we hit the reset line, the yeah, output drops to zero. Good, I label it the right way. And the inverted output goes to one. And it stays. I'll stick that in the angle page somewhere. Okay, um, so set, reset, latch, enables, delatches. Um, and there's other kinds of latches you can have also. Um, what these latches have in common is they're what we call level triggered. Okay, there's, there's some kind of enable input, and things happen when that enable input is set to a 1. Okay, as long as that enable is set to a 1, the data input will appear on the outputs. So, this data, for example, if you turn enable to 1 and you set a 1 on D, you get a 1 out here. If you keep enable high and you drop D to a 0, this goes to 0, and that goes to 1. Okay, the enable basically opens the latch, and whatever comes in on the data appears on the output. And that's called a level triggered latch, because it's the level of this enable line that determines whether things get into the latch or not. And that's a simple design, but it's, it's not the one that we usually use in building more complex circuits because it can lead to race conditions. And as an example, suppose you wanted a counter. Suppose you had, well, all right, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but suppose you have what we call a register. A register is just something, it's a memory that holds a certain number of bits. If it's an 8-bit register, it holds 8 bits. So it would be 8 D flip-flops, for example. So just think of it as a wire version of a, uh, a latch. And here's your enable line coming in. And we're going to take the output, and we'll use this little symbol, a slash with an 8, to show that there's actually 8 lines here. I'm not going to draw eight lines, but there's eight lines coming out, one for each of these eight bits. And suppose what you want to do is you want to take these eight bits, you want to treat them as a number, and you want to add four to that number. So if that corresponds to a particular integer, you want to increase that integer by four. And then you want to take that new value and send it back in to the data lines on this register. And this is also 8 bits. If we use a level trigger design in making this register, what happens as soon as I set enable to 1? If this register started off at the value of 0, that 0 is going to come into your adder, it's going to add 4, you're going to get a value of 4. That's going to go into the data part of your register. It's going to immediately appear on Q. That 4 is going to come around and it's going to change into 8. That's going to go back into the D input, which will appear immediately on the Q outputs. That 8 will get increased by 4 to 12, and so on. Okay, it's going to start just incrementing this, this register's contents as quickly as it, as it can. Okay, and what you really want to do is just increment the register by 4 at one time. 
So with this, this level trigger design, we get this, this race condition. We need to sort of slam this enable gate down as quickly as we can so that it stops uh, adding four to the register. Okay, so that's, that's not a terribly useful design. There's a better way to design these, which is use what's called an edge trigger device. And in an edge trigger device, it's not the level of the enable line that matters, it's the transition of the enable line that causes the input to change into the output. So, let me explain that. Let's suppose the output Q is originally zero, and the input D is zero, and the clock is zero. Okay, with this circuit, if we raise the D line to one, nothing happens. Okay, the clock is, the output Q is still zero. The clock is like an enable, but it's an edge triggered enable. So what happens is as soon as we raise the clock from zero to one, the output will raise to match D. Okay, if clock goes high, the output goes high. Once that happens, the bit is latched. If we drop D at this point, nothing happens. The output stays high even though this clock line is still high. Okay, we can hit the button a bunch of times, keep changing D high and low, and the output stays high. Okay, so edge triggered, as long as the enable is high, the input goes to the output. Sorry, level, level triggered, as long as the input is high, the input goes to the output. On an edge triggered, it's the transition of the clock, the enable line, that determines which bit gets loaded in. Okay, and once that bit is loaded in, it's in there forever. Until you drop the clock, and you raise the clock again. And when you raise the clock again, it samples the D input, which now is zero. That sets the output to zero. Okay, fundamentally different behavior. And the way you build this thing is with a pair of level triggered devices. So these are just our, our regular level triggered D flip flops. And the clock line is basically feeding into the enable of this first one, and the inverse of the clock is feeding into the enable of the second one. And this is what's called a master slave arrangement. And the idea basically is when you raise the clock line, you enable this latch, and your D input goes into this device and it comes out as far as here. But at the time that you wrote that you set this clock to one, this enable went to zero. So this bit goes halfway through your device, but it can't get into this device because this latch is closed. I might have drawn that timing diagram. needs to be another inverter here. So that doesn't correspond to this exactly. The clock is upside down. But anyway, the idea is the same. When the enable line is high here, 
your input bit can get halfway through your device, but it can't get into this, this latch. When you drop the enable line, now that bit that you stored in here comes onto your output. But whatever you happen to be putting into D doesn't go into this because this latch is disabled. Okay, so it forces things to move through in two, two pieces, two steps. So, if we want that to correspond to that, all we have to do is just flip the clock. I think you just down. flip the clock. <laughs> because when the clock goes high, your output doesn't change, but you preload your D value. When the clock goes low, then your output changes. So. Okay, so it's the falling edge of the clock that causes the bit to appear on the output. Okay, it causes the rising edge sort of traps the bit in and the falling edge. It appears on the output. Usually, for different reasons, we work with clocks that are negatively edge triggered, meaning the action happens when the clock drops from one to zero. Okay. This, this is also a fun circuit to put together in a simulator and see what it actually does. And you'll see how things go through in two stages. And to implement this, okay, so this one had the extra inverter on the input of the clock, um, which is missing from the previous picture. The design, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it's basically just, this is a NOR-based latch. This is the enable circuitry. This is another NOR-based latch. This is the enable circuitry. This is the inverter that sends the clock to one enable and the inverse of the clock to another enable. And this is the inverter in the beginning that we were missing in the previous picture. And you can work through this um, on paper and, and see that it's doing what we want it to do. It's using NAND gates instead of NOR gates, it's the same principle. If you use NAND instead of NORs, the sense of the set and reset lines flip. But it's the same idea, you're basically creating a pair of inverters that are cross-coupled to each other with the ability to force those inverters outputs to one or zero. Okay, so you can work through that or you can throw it up in the simulator and, and play with it. Um, this lets us build an interesting device called a toggle flip-flop. And it's usually drawn, that should be a T. Toggle input, there's a clock, there's a Q output. We don't really need Q bar, but you always get it for free, so it's usually in these, these diagrams. And if you use a D flip flop, so this is a master slave edge trigger D flip flop. You take the output and you do an exclusive OR with a toggle line. Okay, just an input called T. You feed that into your D. This is your clock. What does this circuit do? is if your toggle line is zero, okay, you're going to have zero XORed with Q, and a zero XORed with anything is just anything. Okay, zero XORed with one is one, zero XORed with zero is zero. 
So if you have a zero on T, Q is just going to go back into D. And every time that the clock ticks, your value of Q is going to be exactly what it was. Okay, so D is going to be whatever Q was. zero, nothing changes. Okay, whatever bit you're getting out is exactly the same. If you raise t to 1, a 1 xor with anything gives you the inverse of that thing. Okay, 1 xor with 1 is 0, and 1 xor with 0 is 1. So if t is a 1, whatever value of q is coming out, the inverse of that is going to get loaded into d. So d is going to be equal to q complement. And the next time that the clock raises high and low, your output's going to change to the inverse of what it was. then D becomes the complement of Q. So when I raise T to a 1, D also raises to a 1. And when you hit the positive edge of the clock, D gets loaded into the flip-flop and appears on Q. So at this point, Q goes to a 1. OK, you with me so far? When Q goes to a 1, what happens to D? Okay, so there's two things to note here. One, Q is toggling, okay? As this clock is, is pulsing high and low, high and low, the value of Q is also toggling. 
two, it's toggling at half the frequency of the clock. Okay, this thing goes up and down and up and down, and in that time, Q goes up once and down once. Okay, if the clock raises up and down 100 times, Q will go up and down 50 times. So it's a frequency divider, and that's going to be really useful. Okay, so that's a toggle flip flop. That's my favorite flip flop. There's a similar device called a JK flip flop. And a JK is like a set reset, but it also has a toggle flip flop built in. So J acts like a set line and K acts like the reset line. It's an edge trigger device. And if you set J to 1, the output goes to 1. If you set K to 1, the output goes to 0. But in that previous case where we had a set reset flip flop, but both set and reset were 1, that was considered illegal. In this case, if you set J and K to 1, then it just acts like a toggle. And every time the clock goes high, the output Q flips between 1 and 0. OK, and that's, that's a fairly common device to design circuits with. And that's just another example of the timing diagram. Um, you have a running clock. This is positive edge trigger. If J is 1, when the clock goes high and K is 0, your output goes to 1, your inverted output drops. You drop J, nothing happens. You raise K, nothing happens. And so you get the next rise in clock edge. And at that point, the fact that K is 1 says that the output drops to 0. OK, because K is like the reset. And the inverted output raises. And then nothing else happens. And you can raise K again, and still nothing will change because you're just telling it to reset. But the output is already 0, so you don't notice the change. And then over here, you raise J. Nothing happens because the clock is not changed yet at this point. And you raise K, so now both J and K are high. And at this point, you're entering a toggle mode. And each time that the clock raises from 0 to 1, your output will toggle. And you can see that frequency division effect again. Okay, so that's that's sort of the most general version of a, a flip flop of the JK. And I don't have a picture of it, but you can find it pretty easily. All right, so why do I like T flip flops so much? Well, you can build counters out of them. Okay, you can make a circuit. It looks like this. I'm going to make these negative edge triggered. It's you before, think it goes the other way. It's right before the line comes into the box.
assume that all these flip flops are zero originally. Okay, that's kind of where they power up. So what's going to happen each time that the initial clock drops from a one to a zero? So what happens on the first falling edge of that clock line? What happens to Q zero? Gets changed to a one. What happens to Q one? Still zero, right? Its clock just changed from a zero to a one. This is negative edge trigger, so there hasn't been a negative edge yet. So Q1 is unchanged, and the same for Q2. The input is still a zero, so that hasn't changed. Okay, what about the next time the clock raises and then drops? What happens to Q0? It goes back to zero. What happens to Q1? It goes up to one, right? Because now this has gone from one to zero, that's a negative edge. Q1 will toggle. Nothing will happen to Q2 because its clock just went from zero to one. Okay, the next time the clock ticks, we're in the same state as originally. This will go from zero to one. That's a positive edge on Q1, nothing happens, so it stays the same. Nothing's happened on Q2, so that stays zero. And now on the next edge, Q0 becomes zero. That's a negative edge, so that becomes zero. And that becomes a one, because that's a negative edge. Okay? If you know how to write numbers in binary, this is counting. Okay? Zero, one, two, three, four. So you can make counters out of toggle for flops. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, this is a simple way to build counters, but it's not the cleanest way. It's what's called a ripple counter. And it's a ripple counter because when you change an output like this, the effect of that sort of ripples through all the different stages. But that's actually kind of glitchy, because in fact, on that last clock edge, if you look at the values of the outputs, when the clock drops from 1 to 0, the first thing that happens is this output goes to a 0, and your outputs look like that. And then that falling edge eventually works its way through the circuitry of that second flip-flop. And that second flip-flop toggles. And then that second flip-flop's output eventually works through the circuitry of the third one. And this flip-flop finally changes. So your counting sequence is actually from 3 to 2 to 0 to 4. Okay, and if you wanted to do something when this counter reached 0, for example, you'd be doing it right here even though you should have gone from three to four. So you get all these, these temporary glitches, and that may or may not be a problem. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not. But in some cases, it is. And so there's another way to make counters, which is called a synchronous counter. And a synchronous counter, the idea is all the outputs change at the same time instead of rippling through. It's a more complicated design, but it's pretty simple logically. Basically, um, another way to count is to say, Toggle any bit if all the bits to the right are one. And so you don't actually cascade each output into the other stages clock. Each bit sort of operates independently and simultaneously and it just says, if all the bits to the right are one, I'm going to toggle. So in this case, since all the bits to the right are one, this will toggle on the next clock tick. This bit will not. This bit will toggle from here to here because all the bits to the right are one. And so you can, you can build a circuit where each bit changes at the same time as every other bit just by doing this, this sort of look ahead. Now that's harder to build because you have to add more circuitry to look at previous stages, but it gives you a cleaner output. And if you build a circuit that counts in gray code, remember we talked about gray codes when we were doing K-maps? If your counting sequence looks like If you 
use a sequence like that, only one bit changes from one number to the next. Okay, and that's that's another way that you can make counters that don't have these glitches. That's why gray codes are used sometimes. Okay, but you have to count in a different way like this. Okay, registers, which I already mentioned, are basically just a collection of flip-flops treated as one sort of logical unit. Um, and it, it can literally be just 8D registers, where you have a D input for each, 8D flip-flops with a D input going to each one. The enable line or the clock line is fed to all eight stages simultaneously, and it just acts like a big, wide flip-flop. So these things are usually called registers. When you're inside a CPU and you're actually doing low-level instructions like incrementing numbers or adding two numbers and so on, the things that you're operating on, the variables inside the hardware, those are registers. Okay, they're sets of 8 or 16 or 32 or 64 flip-flops treated as a single unit. So the variables inside the CPU, there are also um, different special purpose registers inside a CPU. There's an address register which says, where am I reading instructions from in memory? Where am I reading my program from in memory? That's a register. Um, there's an instruction register which holds the actual instruction that you're about to execute. There's, um, there's a state register that stores certain um, flags that tell you, was your last operation something that resulted in a zero? Or did your last operation result in a negative number? Or is there an overflow condition on an operation you just did? So there's a lot of different registers inside a CPU, and, and we'll be looking at those when we talk about data paths and, um, and start designing uh, what goes on inside the CPU. So lots of registers. Um, and these registers usually need to be set up in some kind of master-slave way. That example I gave you over here where you're adding four to a register, that's typically something that happens with the program counter. The program counter points to the memory of the computer and says, where is the next instruction that I need to execute? And after you execute an instruction, you need the next instruction, which is usually, say, four locations after the previous one. And so that circuit is an example of how you increment the program counter. And you want to do it one step at a time. You want to give it a signal that says, go ahead and increment and have it add four to the contents of the register. So you would usually use some kind of master-slave um, registers as opposed to something just um, level triggered. Okay, and then a memory is basically just a collection of registers. So it's like a two-dimensional set of um, flip-flops. And typically, the way a memory looks is something like this. You have a series of address lines going in. Okay, so let's make this a 16 by 8 memory, so it holds 128 bits. So you have an address bus. A bus is just a collection of lines. It's just a naming convention, so if you have eight lines that are all treated as one thing, you call it a bus. So this is an address bus because it holds a series of bits that correspond to an address or a location inside this memory. We can call these A0 through A3. data bus, D0 through D7, which give you the contents of what's stored at the address that you're pointing to with the address bus. labeled something like read slash write bar. This says whether you're reading from the memory or writing into the memory. And then you have some kind of enable line. Okay, it's a two-dimensional flip-flop, so it's got a lot of lines.
basically, you can think of this as being 16 rows of registers or 16 rows of flip flops with each row having eight columns to it. each of these locations you have 8 bits stored. Okay, so you can store 16 numbers, each number being 8 bits. And if you want to read a value out of this, you basically tell it what address you want to read from by setting these four address lines to the right values, of ones and zeros. You set the read line to a 1. So. So technically the data bus is, is, a, is an in-out, right? It's not... Normally it's in-out. I didn't want to talk about bi-directional buses just yet, so oh, you okay. can think of it as having an input bus here and an output bus okay. there. You can do it either way. But that's what the read-write is for, though, if you, if you have a bi-directional bus. Well, even if you have this, you need to know um, whether or not you want to write this data into memory. Oh, okay. Okay, but you could always read from the outputs. And so this would just be a right line, basically. Okay. Okay, so these would basically be feeding the D inputs on the flip-flops, and these are coming from the Q outputs on the flip-flops. And if your read-write line is set to a 1, then you're reading whatever 8 bits are stored at that address. If you set your read-write line to a 0, then it takes the values coming in on the input bus, and it stores it into the corresponding 8 flip-flops. So, the flip-flops in one of these rows will get modified to the D values that you're feeding in. And the row is selected by the address bus bits. Okay, we'll come back to this when we start talking about data paths inside the CPU. Okay, I'm just kind of giving you a preview. But you can make this out of, out of uh, D, lat D latches if you want. or. Um, flip-flops, and it's an expensive way to build a memory, especially if you want like a 4 gigabyte memory, um, but you can do it. Okay, if you do that, that's called a static RAM, static random access memory. That's basically a collection of, of flip-flops or latches. Um, the really good designs for static RAM is use about 6 transistors per bit. which is pretty good, but it's not really dense. If, if you actually lay these things out, they take a lot of space because you're basically making cross-coupled inverting gates and hooking them up to each other, plus adding some enable and clocking logic. Um, and it ends up being a fairly um, large design compared to a dynamic random access memory. And a DRAM, it operates the same way, but it's a very different design inside. In a DRAM, you're basically using one transistor per bit. And remember when we talked about transistors, we talked about gate capacitance and the fact that when you charge up the gate of a transistor, it sort of traps some electrons in there. Okay, this is why there's a propagation delay. Well, we can use that in a DRAM and actually store bit values in that capacitive charge at the gate of a transistor. Okay, and that's how DRAMs are designed. Now, it's nice because it's very, very dense, but the downside is this charge doesn't last very long. It will eventually dissipate. So when you have a DRAM, you need to refresh these charges periodically, okay, pretty frequently. And so DRAMs need a clocking circuit associated with them that basically sweeps through, I mean, it's usually done in rows or columns, it's not each individual one, but sweeps through this over and over and over again. And any time that it finds a one stored on the transistor, it'll write a one back into it. Okay, to sort of bump up the charge again, bring it back to its full capacity. 
and it does that sweep quickly enough that the capacitors don't discharge between sweeps. Okay, so it's a more expensive process, but very, very, very dense. Okay, and this is where you get the, you know, two gigabyte on a small card. Um, that's all dynamic RAM. That's probably a good place to stop for now because what we're going to do on Thursday is talk about um, state machines and we're going to use flip flops um, as a way to implement state machines and that will conclude this first part. Uh, yeah. You said that VM was very expensive also, so which is more expensive? Oh, it's expensive uh, design wise. I mean, it's all. I could be in this foreign circuit to do the refresh. <laughs> So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, one, one thing DRAM is cheap, not because of the volume. Output, you know, um, anything that, that gets used in PC a lot gets a lot of from this. Because the cost gets amortized across or so, 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 whatever it is per year. So, DRAM is cheap. It's going to work on some online computer. Right. Yeah, so